This talk is called Getting the Content Out from Heidelberg to Varnish. Um, and it's about a guy who's called Karl Geo Ferdinand Gilke. Does anybody know who he was? Good. Um, content production is not new. Publishing is not new. Uh, this picture is from uh, a set of British forces somewhere in Afghanistan, the last time the British were there. And it's pretty much the same kind of thing we have today. We have some stuff to deal with text in one corner. We have images in another corner. We have something to set the overall policy, stuff like that. And we have something that pushes the content out. And we also have the bit we don't know what does. But if we take it out, things stop working, so we leave it in. So nothing much new there. Um, content creation requires a lot of things. You need to have uh, full control over your text, your images, and all these composition tools. Um, it's been updated quite a bit. And it's something that you actually can automate and have been able to automate for a long time. This is a linotype. Um, Linotypes were produced for more than 90 years. And um, if you read a newspaper 30 years ago, you'd notice that most of the spelling mistake was two letters being flipped around. And that's basically because they have not lubricated the linotype well enough, so one of the letters came before the other one, despite them being pushed in opposite order. Um, I don't think we'll see any of our CMSs survive 90 years just on general principles. Content production, on the other hand, once you've composed your content, you need to get it out to all the people who need to see it. And that is simply a mindless repetition of the same thing. And we have machines for that, too. And you usually get one of these with your CMS. It's about the same quality. But if you really want to get your content out, the machine you should look at is this one. It's the Heidelberg Windmill, or in Europe it's called the Heidelberg Wing. The crucial bit about it is that it can move paper reliably. And that's it. Until then, printing presses had been finicky beasts where getting the paper through them was a problem. This one will take one piece of paper per second, get it through, print on it, and get it out again. Let's see if this works. If you ever find some art print shop or something like that, you should go visit them if they have one of these beasts. It's some of the best German mechanical engineering you'll ever find. And that's part of the inspiration for varnish. I manned one of these beasts while I was in high school. And it takes about three minutes to learn how to use this thing. It's all it takes. There's like three handles you need to use, and that's it. And it can do any printing job you really want up until the size of paper you can fit into it. This one can print on individual business cards. And it just keeps going. So the Varnish elevator pitch is that Varnish is an HTTP delivery engine. We used to call it a cache, but it's getting to do more and more stuff. It's a general purpose HTTP processor. It's a HTTP cache. It can do content composition. Cheap hardware will run 100 kilo requests. More expensive hardware will run probably a million requests. Uh, free and open source software, and there's commercial support. And the history is there was a uh, Norwegian newspaper that had performance problems. Norway is a very special media market in that there's a lot of places you can live in Norway where you cannot get today's newspaper. In fact, most of the places you can live in Norway, you can't get today's newspaper. So for the Norwegian newspapers, going online was actually an expansion of their market. They got more readers that way. And the thing these people were seeing were all the classical stuff, terrible peak handling, packet loss, whatever, slow responses. So they said, we have to do something better, uh, and started this uh, Varnish open source project. At the time, they were running Squid on 12 servers. When we were done, they were running Varnish on three servers. And that's mostly so that one of them would be a spare. They can actually run the entire traffic on one server still. That is, until some nutcase with a gun started blowing up bombs and killing people. And this is the real problem 
these days in content. That is, the traffic spikes. The best thing you can hope for is to be on the front page of CNN. And the worst thing that can happen to a website is you're on the front page of the CNN. Um, and we even have terrorists out there. I'm not kidding. This guy mentions your web page and it goes down. He gets 45 new Twitter followers an hour. It's like the death kiss of meters, this thing. Anyway, Varnish, we started from scratch, setting some goals. And the goals were Varnish is HTTP. We don't do FTP, we don't do SSL, we don't do anything, just HTTP. We want to have a better configuration, we want to have better management, we want it to be much faster. And we want to focus on the content management feature set. Um, the first thing requires a bit of explanation. If you read the RFC 2616 standard, there is one single mention on, of server-side caches. And that's because they forgot to take that one out. Originally, the draft had a class of caches on the server side. And they realized a cache on the server side is just a web server. It's an origin server. It's not different in any way because it has knowledge of the content. So Varnish is not a cache in the RFC sense of the word. It is a web server. The guy who runs the Varnish server is the same guy who owns the content. He can get to decide what he wants to do it. And where he wants to do things is his choice. So with that out of the way, configuration files. I've been in the business for 27 years, and I hate configuration files because they have this archaeological kind of layering. And um, even once you get past that, it's anybody's idea what's going on. <laughs> and considering how few women there are in the computing business, I do not understand why we keep doing this. What we really want to do is we want to look at industrial control systems. Uh, people have been thinking about how you run a, a railroad network, as this one, how you run an atomic plant, how you run that kind of complex setups in a way where people can actually manage them. And I've tried to take a page from that with Varnish. Um, so Varnish has a, a central state machine, which is what your request will go through. And all the blue boxes is where you get to stick your fingers into the traffic and do things. Um, so the request comes into VCL receive, and you can look at it and decide what you want to do and where you want to go. Then you build a hash key to look up in the, in the Varnish uh, hash table. And if you get a hit, you get to look at it again. If you get a miss, you get to look at it again. We also have pass, which is I don't want to cache this. I'll just go directly to the back end. And we have the pipe option, which means go to the back end, and it may not even be HTTP. Um, or it may be HTTP, I don't understand. Um, and then finally, we get into VCL fetch, if we fetch it from the back end, and VCL deliver to send it out to, to the user. And the point about this is that all these blue boxes, you get a chance to write a program in Varnish configuration language, which is a domain-specific language for dealing with HTTP requests. And you can do all sorts of things. You can do kind of much security things, saying if somebody is trying to exploit Windows, just drop them off. Um, it transpires that many of the uh, exploitation tools that hackers use expect the servers to be compliant. So if you send them a HTTP status code, which is like 999, they don't like it. Um, you can, in some cases, core dump them by setting a 40-digit code. But Vanish doesn't support that, unfortunately. Um, Access control lists, uh, the, the journalists on the newspaper get a different behavior than the, the regular users. You don't want to cache it for the journalist because they'll just hit reload all the time. Um, one of the most unpopular people uh, at a particular Danish newspaper, during live coverage of a handball match against Norway, he wrote in the text, and make sure you press Shift F5 all the time to get the news co uh, coverage. And uh, the content delivery people ran up to his office and um, You can do all sorts of things. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. The bottom one is interesting. 
one of the worst thing you can do is send out the wrong URL and then not replying to people when they come back. You have, with Varnish, you have a chance to rewrite it on the way back in so you don't lose customers that way. And the reason why VCL really rocks is that we compile it into C code. I have yet to see anybody write a VCL program where we could measure the performance difference, with one exception, and they machine generated 10,000 regular expressions. We could measure that. But otherwise, VCL just runs. There's, it's not like PHP or Perl or Python or something that's interpreted. It's actually compiled to code that instructions that run on your CPU. You can also have multiple VCL programs loaded at the same time. That means you can load your new configuration, try it out for five seconds, switch back to the old one when you realize it's not going very well. Um, in the future, you will be able to have multiple requests running on different VCLs. Um, that's not in the tree yet, but it's coming. And if you can't do it in the VCL language, which is sort of a small domain-specific language, we have, um, you can write a shared library called a VMOD in C or C++ and pull that in to do, I don't know, GOIP or whatever you want to do. And you can do inline C if you're really hardcore. So one example of what you can do is a simple uh, network distribution uh, case. You have your stuff on the back end in the USA, and you have a varnish in Germany, and you have one in England. And you can have these two talk to each other first before they go to the USA with six lines of, seven lines, I guess, of VCL code. Um, managing varnish, you really don't want to have programs where you need a browser to manage the program. You want to have something you can do from your mobile phone. Uh, so we have a command line interface oh, that controls the entire thing. Um, we split the varnish process into a manager process and a worker process. Um, it allows us to do privilege separation on the worker process. It cannot open random files in your system and the management process can still do the VCL compilation, all that. Um, and the big picture is this one. Um, the green line, the green box, that's actually one binary program that contains two processes um, that confuses people a little bit sometimes and confuses debugger more sometimes. Um, but the manager process is the privileged process that will uh, receive your CLI commands and deal with them, in some cases sending them on to the caching process. And the caching process is the one that does all the work. This is where you have 10,000, 100,000 threads trying to serve your HTTP request. Um, the, the CLI interface is a typical command line interface. You've seen them before. Um, we try to, to make it self-documented and, and uh, provide sufficient detail that you don't have to look up in the manual all the time. For instance, parameters come with a description of what they do and um, caveats if we don't know what they do. So performance and speed, and this is probably where, where Vanish has distinguished itself most. Um, I happen to be a kernel programmer. Um, and I spent 12 years being the main contributor to the FreeBSD kernel. And I saw a increasingly disturbing trend that people would tell me that my kernel was broken and if I spent the time looking at it, I found that they couldn't program. They would do things like take timestamps before and after each IO, take timestamps before and after each network packet, um, mo move data around needlessly and stuff like that. And when I was contacted about Varnish initially, I was sort of like, do I really want to write a web tool? It's like, nah. But on the other hand, it gave me a chance to show how to write a program that uses a modern operating system kernel. And OK, admittedly, I could use the money. The basic problem is this is not what a computer looks like. But no matter which book on programming you open, this is the picture it contains in chapter one. Von Neumann built computers that look like this. And we did until, I think, 1964. Virtual memory is invented in 1964. Um, a modern computer looks more like this, except it's very likely that the vendor of the chips will not tell you what boxes there are, how they're connected, and what they contain. Uh, you may have a CPU socket, but you plug a lot more than a CPU into it these days. And even if you knew this and had all the details about the line width of the cache and all this sort of stuff, 
there's an operating system that hides all this, or at least obscures it. So the programming model should look something like this. You have bits of silicon that executes instructions. They may be CPUs, they may be cores, they may be hyperthreads, they may be other things they invent. They have caches, which means there's some things that are closer on than other things. And then you have a virtual page cache. It's not memory in the way you think about it. And finally, you have your object store, which can be very far away, uh, behind 21 kilometers of fiber if you have redundant database set up, setups and stuff like that. And the reason why this is important is that when they invented virtual memory, it took something like 1,000 instructions to read in a new page from the drum. But today, the span of speeds in your computer is much higher. If you do something trivial that involves a CPU register, you can do more than a billion of those per second per call on your computer. None of you get anywhere close to that because fiddling around with the register in a CPU is utterly uninteresting. Once you start accessing your memory, doing something like the length of a string or something like that, things get slower because memory is slower. But we pick up memory in big chunks. Uh, memory widths of 128 bits are quite common these days. So once you get it started, it pipelines pretty well. Once you start moving things in memory, taking them from one piece and putting them somewhere else, you get right, memory, uh, right operations in, and you have to do cache synchronization between your different sockets, and things get slower yet. Then you add locking, which means you have to have uh, atomic memory operations, where you have to say all the other CPUs, hey, stop for a moment. Thanks, you can continue. That's expensive. We're talking now about losing 1,000 instructions every time you do one of these things. System calls, you have to go into the kernel, you have to look at the parameters that came, look whether this looks legit, security issues. You have to change the entire VM mapping into the kernel because there's things you can't see in userland that you can in the kernel. Uh, context switch in case you want to go to a different thread while this one does something and so on. And all the way we get further and further down until we end at the very bottom where you do something like open a file where you have to go out on the disk and find the directory and create a inode and fiddle the directory again and fiddle the inode again and then finally you can return and say, well, what do you know? You have a directory. You may be able to do hundreds of those per second on a loaded system. SSDs help the bottom part of this a lot but it doesn't cure the basic problem. Um, here's a simple example. You write a program and you need to log all your transactions. So you open a file and you print your transactions into the file. If you do a million transactions, this can take 16 minutes on a system that is busy doing actual work. The way we do it is we write it into shared memory. There's a service where the operating system kernel will say, I can put this file into your memory space. So we do that. And then we just simply put our lock records into that memory space. The kernel will take care that this actually ends up on the disk eventually. And if the process crashes, the kernel will put it on disk anyway. I don't need to call fsync after each record to make sure it's up to date on the disk. Now it takes 10 seconds. This is why during the previous user group meeting, uh, Arthur Bergman set up a test just on one of the, the VKM machines. And I think he used Browsum up for it. And you get behavior like this at this CPU load. Uh, yesterday, Comcast said, I think, 20 gigabytes, gigabit from a box using 5% of one of the CPUs. And that's sort of the optimal case because they have a chunk of video, which is the most recent one second of the Super Bowl, and everybody's watching that one. But um, we do not have throughput issues in Varnish compared to anything else, as far as I know. Having this shared memory um, locking allows us to actually lock more information than you normally do because it's so cheap. And that means we have this program called Varnish Top, which will pick out whatever records you want to look at and show you the top list of them. For instance, in this case, where does my traffic come from? Or what is my most popular URL? And this is a, a real-time view. This is not something, you know, average over 15 minutes or something like this, you can sit watching it, see it shift up and down, and you can see they publish a story about the soccer team or whatever, and boom, it runs to the top. Um, we have another tool, which is a response time histogram. It shows you the time it takes from we have the request to we're ready to send the response 
at the bottom in seconds. So this is one microsecond, 10 microseconds, 100 microseconds. And you can see the cache hits and the, cat, the cache misses come in two classes. In this case, that's two different backends. One of them is a backend for static content, and the other one is a backend for dynamic content. So that's basically what the price of starting PHP. Um, statistics counters, the same thing. They're in shared memory. You can just access them. And the important thing here is that you can examine all these statistics without ever disturbing the varnish D process. It doesn't know that you're looking at it. It's not like you're opening a socket and having it formatted as HTML and spit that back at you. So looking at the process does not affect its running. It's like having a window into the stomach of it. Content management features. Um, a cache that sits on the client side is a pretty dumb box, all things considered. About the only interaction you have with it is turn it off and turn it on again if it does something wrong. Sitting on the, on the server side, we're actually part of the task force that delivers the content. And that means some of the things we can do better than the backend can do. Um, and sometimes we can clean up messes that the backend make. If, for instance, the backend sends wrong headers and you can't change it, well, we can change it for you in Varnish. Um, we have instant action purges and bans. Um, I'll talk to the, about those in a second. Um, the caching policy for your objects in Varnish in the Varnish cache and on the client side caches can be controlled because you can set whatever headers you want to set. Um, you can do load and situation mitigation. You could have one VCL program that you use as normally and then one you use during soccer matches or during Super Bowl or whatever that has different behaviors and like during Super Bowl, nobody cares about the rest so we can cache that much longer and stuff like that. Um, header washing, just generally uh, cleaning up. A, a classical one is where the back end will send very user agent because they want to know whether this is uh, Internet Explorer or uh, Chrome or Firefox. And doing a very user agent is really, really stupid because there's only two user agents. There's only two browsers in the entire world that send the same string. All the rest of them seem to be unique. Um, I, I did a, 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 I examined stats on one particular server and we saw 125,000 different user agents on a single server. Um, so the thing about being tracked, I can see how they can do that. Um, that's the barrier washing thing. And then we have edge sites includes which, which I'll talk about in a moment. Purchase, purchase and bans is, um, we confused the heck out of people by naming these wrong in the first version because we didn't want to confuse people, so we did. Um, a perch is a eviction on a direct criteria. Basically, you go in and you do a lookup just like if you did a get. You get the object and you kill it. This is sort of like perch works in squid, and you have to have the exact criteria. Bands, on the other hand, allows you to prevent cache hits in the future that matches this criteria. And that's very useful if you come in in a strange case where suddenly somebody is at the door with a court order or somebody did something really stupid in the CMS system, so you have a bunch of pages that are rendered wrongly or whatever. Um, bands are a lazy evaluation. Whenever somebody gets a cache hit, we check if there's any new bands they need to check against, and if they match any of them, it's not a cache, uh, cache hit anyway. Um, very useful for doing strange things. And you can do a whole lot of other stuff in VCL. Um, rewrite your URLs, um, all that sort of stuff. One interesting one is the one I call spider dieting. If you're a newspaper and you have all your 112 years of newspapers online, and the Google spider comes around, and you changed your, I don't know, color of the frame around your content, they'll ask for all your articles. And you'll have your tape library going down in the basement. So what you do is you say, if the user agent contains spider, we only do cache hits. If they do a cache miss, we say 400 and whatever, come back later. So avoid pulling the entire old content into your cache. Or maybe you give them one hour every night where they can do cache, uh, cache misses and stuff like that. And as I said, if VCL cannot do it, you have modules um, and inline C code. So no matter what, you can do it. In version three, we have added gzip support so that we can gzip and gunzip uh, instead of having the backend do it. And basically, the one box that's missing up here is we never compress sending to the client. 
The ideal situation is that everything stored in Varnish is stored as GZIP, and then the very few clients, i.e. spiders, that don't do GZIP will G unzip for those. Edge side includes is a way to um, reduce the load on your CMS database. Basically, you have the front page of the Washington Post, which doesn't change much. Then you have whatever article is presented here. You have uh, these ads. You have an uh, index of today and the sports results and the weather. And, and all these different components have different lifetimes. But you cannot do that by sending the entire thing to the cache and say, OK, the bit in here you can cache for this long, and this bit you can cache for this long. So instead, what you do is you tell the cache in front of you, you say, at this point, insert the right index.html, and at this point, insert article number blah. And then Varnish will pick up these properties separately, and they will have different lifetimes and send, com, put them into the data stream before we send it to the client. And that means the, the article on a newspaper can basically be cached indefinitely. Once it's written, they're not going back to edit it because it's much better to write a new story, new development, right? Um, whereas the index, you want that updated once a minute or, or whatever your flow is. And of course, we do support GC with ESI. And that's kind of interesting because how do you splice together compressed files? Well, as a matter of fact, you can do that, I find out. Um, a gzip file con consists of a header and a tail and a number of co uh, uh, compressed blocks in the middle. So what we do is we g unzip it when we get it from the back end and compress it back again, making sure to align these pieces to the various ESI directives so that when it comes to expanding them, we can actually go down and splice in the content of another compressed file in the middle of it. So we can actually splice together compressed files without ever uncompressing and compressing them again on delivery. And that basically means that ESI with GSIP is line speed in Varnish. About the name, I have always include this one. Um, Anas Baer, who got the idea for Varnish, was in bed with a uh, um, dislocated, um, what do you call it, disk in his back lying there for half a year staring at a poster, one of these French art posters with vanishage. And he swore to himself that as soon as he got out of bed, he would look up that word. And one of the meanings of varnish is to give a deceptively attractive appearance to. And that is what varnish will do for your web server. We will give you very quick responses, even though you have a database and memcached and all these other things to, to deal with behind it. And I could go on talking about Varnish for a long time, because Varnish can do an awful lot of things in an awful lot of strange ways. Um, one of the, my focus on Varnish is in code quality. So we have test cases that do coverage testing of 85 point, actually today I think it's 6% of the source code. 10% of the source code lines are a search to make sure that things don't go wrong. Because once you have 10,000 threads running, um, <laughs> It takes less than a millisecond before a core dump is totally unusable as debugging aid. And um, lots of other things. Ac access control lists, we compile them into C code, so they're very fast no matter how big they are. We use the C compiler's optimizer to optimize them. Um, plenty to learn. Um, development of Varnish is funded through something I call the Varnish Moral License. Um, and that is really a sponsorship. But sponsorships are usually the marketing department, and they'll come with these thick binders about logo placement and choice of color for letterhead and, and all this stuff. And I don't want to deal with that. License, that's clearly something in the IT department. And uh, Facebook, uh, Vikia, um, Vanish Software in Norway, and uh, a couple of other companies have uh, taken out these licenses, which allows me to develop Vanish um, about 60% of my time. So. Varnish is, I hope, the network equivalent of the Heidelberg Wing, a general purpose tool that will just work and work and work and keep working. But I don't know if I can compete with its 135-year production run. They actually started producing that particular one before they had invented the, uh, the handle. Questions?
Yes. Um, you mean when you update the VCL code? No, no, no. The shared library is the configuration for Varnish. Varnish will pick up HTTP from your backend. So your CMS presents the usual web server, and we just pick up from, from that one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we, um, we have been looking at whether we should support things like fast CGI in addition to HTTP, and I think we have a patch to do that. I'm not quite convinced we want to do that, but we may go that way. But basically, we just go between an HTTP server of some kind and the audience to make things faster. Um, normally, we don't look at the content at all. The content for us is just bytes. The exception is uh, ESI and GZIP. Uh, but we will look at the HTTP headers, the, the expires header, uh, the cache control header, stuff like that. Uh, yes. Um, good question. I know that there's at least two implementation of VMOD security-like stuff. Uh, as a VMOD, you pull in, basically just to keep the junk away from the back end, because the default behavior. Uh, of a cache is that it's not seen the attack before, so it will send it to the back end. So by default, Vanis will make sure your back end sees all the attacks and very little of your traffic. And um, just some basic scrubbing can take a lot of the attacks away. There's a lot of botnets out there still trying to exploit old versions of uh, internet server. And, and just scraping that out will mean your back end won't have to deal with it. But it's also very useful for specific threats that you can go in and you can say, OK, we're tired of this guy. If, if the request that comes from this IP number, just throw him out and reload the configuration in Varnish without reloading the configuration in Varnish doesn't cost you your cache content. You just flip the pointer to use the new configuration and, and you're moving. So, so that way, it's very good for, for dynamic handling of threats or mistakes or whatever. How well is? Uh, right now, we only support a single range. Uh, and that's because I did a very large survey and didn't see one single multi-range request. So we implemented single range. And then I think Adobe changed Acrobat to use multi-range. Uh, multi huh? A range, a range request is the client saying, I need this object. Get me this one, but only send these bytes. And Adobe uses that to show you page 37 and stuff like that. So, but we'll probably do multi-range requests soonish. Um, we lock all the traffic into the shared memory segment. And then you have uh, one of the programs we have is Varnish NCSA, which generates NCSA standard log records based on that content. And you can feed that into your uh, statistics engine. Um, there's many other ways you can do it. Embed you know, one by uh, one, by one uh, images that go through that you don't cache and stuff like that. Um, Arthur talked a little bit about basically using uh, Google Analytics from the client side. And that's probably the better way to do it, because that way you also get past any client side caches to see what your content does. Uh, it's not supported yet. We have a, a patch for it. Um, uh, Joff from Germany has written a patch for it. And um, that's scheduled for inclusion. Uh, it's a matter of me sitting down, looking over his patch, and, and getting it integrated. 
Um, it didn't seem very important until now. Uh, the reason it's come up, I think, is one particular CMS in Germany for a big publishing house. And uh, it's a good feature, so we'll take it. So. It's, it's very simple. I can tell you exactly why we don't support SSL and HTTPS. I don't think we'd do a good job at it. Um, Doing HTTPS means we'll have to do key material. And Varnish is not written in a way for handling that level of confidential data. Um, not that I think there's any way it would leak out in, in normal circumstances, but you have tens of thousands of threads jumping around all over the place. And the last thing you need to have in there is your secret certificate. Um, the other thing is that doing SSL means a lot of processing word, a work, and it needs to, um, many of the tricks we use in Varnish are not applicable to HTTPS. So compared to running, say, Pound or any other SSL proxy in front of your Varnish, we could add very little value sticking all that code into Varnish. And the most sensible uh, SSL implementation I've seen were 35,000 lines of code. And they were not 35,000 lines of good code. Uh, open SSL is 10 times that. And the code is even worse. Um, so I would multiply the size of Varnish by somewhere between 50% and 300, well, I guess 500% to add SSL, and I would not do a significantly better job than you could do with Pound. So it's simply a matter of why. The, the only thing you would gain is you'd gain one less process to do this. But the next thing you would come and ask me for, oh, now you have SSL. Where's the hardware accelerated SSL in Varnish, right? And it's like. I don't know if there's actually a pattern to use it on that space. Uh, I know some people use Pound. Um, there's a couple of other SSL proxies that people use. Um, I think even some use NGNX as SSL proxy. Um, but I, I wouldn't claim I can see a pattern in how people do it. Um, in general, people, if it works, they don't tell me about it. So I only hear about what doesn't work. Um, that's a common curse of open source. You really only hear about the problems people have. It's like, and then every so often you go to a conference and somebody says, yeah, we have 800 year boxes. They do fine. OK. Um, my professional pride would, of course, have to say, obviously. <laughs> um, I think you should use the operating system that hurts the least in your organization. And um, that's a matter of the skill set you have, the amount of red tape you have to cut, and whatever else. Um, very few people today select operating system based on technical merits. It's usually mostly a human resources decision that if you have an organization stuffed full with Linux geeks, you run Linux. And if they run all no Solaris, you run Solaris, provided you can afford it. Um, <laughs> and, and FreeBSD has a more, many of the things Arthur was saying this morning is like, yeah, I've heard about that else. And, and FreeBSD has a much more server focused I mean, in the FreeBSD project, the element is different. I've run FreeBSD in my laptop, not this one, but the one I have at home. And it's like, FreeBSD is not very good on a laptop, but it's damn good on a server. So I would tend to think that, yes, FreeBSD would do, at the very least, as well as Linux, probably quite a bit better. But with the kind of performance levels we have, it's not really that important. 
I mean, when you get into Arthur's kind of level of traffic, um, yes, then you need to start to pay attention to it. But most of the people who deploy Varnish on Linux will never get to the settings Arthur started talking about this morning because not many people have that level of traffic. So, but give it a shot. You might like it. Yes? I've been keeping an eye on it. And the, the, any thoughts on Speedy, the, the Google proposed protocol? And um, yeah, that's one thing, but you can actually fake that quite a bit of the way. You can have SSL without actually encrypting. But um, to s some part of the way, Speedy is part of a uh, political agenda. Um, if, they, if they wrote Speedy just to speed up web delivery, they would have done it differently. Um, you wouldn't have variable length stuff in there, for instance. Um, part of the point of Speedy is to prevent people mocking about with their content, inserting ads into it, um, disabling malfunctioning caches and stuff like that. And while I may certainly be behind that agenda, um, I'm not sure I see Varnish as really being instrumental to it. If, if Speedy starts to gain traction, then we'll do it. But right now, I have very few people asking for Speedy. If I actually don't think I've had any directly ask for it. It's like, are you going to do it? Yes or no? It's like, probably not. OK, fine. Um, so. You mean, can you insert ads with Varnish? <laughs> we do that with ESI. Um, but I, that, that's not a place where you can put in regular expressions and run them over the content. But you can do anything you want from a VMOD, including do things to the content. Um, for something like that, you would probably want to have a delivery time hook to deal with the content as it goes out the wire, rather than having to modify the in-memory copy that will be used by multiple requests. Um, we don't have that now, but it wouldn't be very hard to add it if you need that. Uh, the one thing is that we, the way content is stored in Varnish is optimized for delivery speed more than for being able to access it. So an object will typically be stored in multiple pieces, and you'll have to follow that linked list to, to find it all. So. I mean, Varnish can do the load balancing for you also. Well, yeah. If, if, I mean, if you have something that works and you have bigger problems, deal with those problems first. Um, but if, you, if you're looking to roll in Varnish, I would probably roll in Varnish behind the Nginx and then remove the Nginx subsequently. As, as a trend, uh, tr yeah, well, put them in front of Nginx and remove that one. I mean. That's all a matter of how you approach it in, in your operation. Yeah, exactly. The, the interesting thing of, of using Varnish as a traffic director is that the ca I mean, you can use Varnish without ever caching anything, just using it to spread your traffic around. But having the cache facility means that you could also have a coverage for servers going down, either saying, if the, if, if the back end is down, you can use whatever content you had most recently for an hour. And, and then later on, you can load another VTL that says, OK, three hours. Eh? Um, or you can, have, uh, you can redirect traffic differently based on failures and stuff like that. So you can have uh, various kinds of emergency content. Um, I used to have a slide. Uh, they actually have the best uh, broken server page I've ever seen has the vg.no people. It has this cracked glass in front of it. 
and then a fake front page with various interesting pieces of news. The one, one you can really see through the cracked glass is the technical update when they'll be back up. It's, it's really well made. Um, and then they'll rickroll you while they're at it. Um, actually, I guess they'll rickroll anybody. They've rickrolled all of Norway in X rickroll colon. Um, but, but it is a general purpose tool, and, and you can do pretty much anything you want to do with it. So it's hard to say something without knowing exactly what your business is. Um, right now you do. Um, we want to have a CLI interface where you can uh, call a backend sick or healthy. Um, haven't gotten around to that um, because of a naming issue, really. Um, finding out what the name of a backend is is surprisingly complex. Once you think about backends that has a DNS name that changes IP numbers and stuff like that on the way. Um, but loading a new VCL is not something that takes a long time. We're talking one second kind of things. I mean, until you add a 10,000 line access list or something like that, you won't notice loading a new VCL. So. Um, we don't have that right now. Uh, we do? <laughs> oh, we do. Yeah, but it's not a throttling. It, it kind of just chops them off at the, at the top when we do that. Yeah. No. Nope. <laughs> um, we have a couple of weird mechanisms. Um, one of them is called Grace. And basically what Grace says is that, provided we have reason to think that we're getting the new content from the back end, you can serve the old one in the meantime. So that the, the way it typically works out is that the object expires, and the next saga to come around and look for it gets to go to the back end and pick it up. But the next one, he'll just get the old one because we know the new one is on the way, so we don't need to wait. Um, and we also have a mode that's called sync mode, which can blacklist. If your server fails on a particular URL, we'll make the back end sick for that one URL, but not the rest of them. Yes. Um, it's hard to explain, actually. <laughs> so. Any more questions? I guess not. <laughs>